So I'll be doing some introductions instead of Mia Draka, I told the children to die. My introductions will be as, at least as successful as Mia Draka. Let me welcome first um, Martin Borowski, who is with us today to tell us something about principles from uh, legal principles from a philosophical perspective. Martin is uh, the most important thing for me being my supervisor in Heidelberg do, during my, my colleague, Alexander von Humboldt colleague, colleague um, uh, my Alexander von Humboldt fellowship, but more importantly for you. So one of the most prominent theorists in Germany dealing with legal principles. And Mildred was already telling you about this at the end of this, uh, the last lecture. Also, Professor of Philosophy of Law and Constitutional Law in Heidelberg. So there are two ways students, when, when they finish the Faculty of Law, they usually say, yeah, this, uh, everything that we learned in theory doesn't work in actually in practice. But both ways are wrong of saying that. One of the ways in which theoretical concepts don't work in practice is that judges and legal practice simply makes mistakes. So they, they are wrong completely. Um, one of the ways in which Serbian legal practice is often wrong is when applying principles, legal principles, and when trying to understand legal principles. And one of the main tasks of philosophy of law in this sense is to clarify things. And uh, the combination of theory of practice in this course, actually, especially the way we, we put it this year, practice comes first, and after that we have theory. One of the main tasks of the theoretical parts is to clarify the concepts which are often muddled in practice. And you saw in the last lecture that one, one of those muddled concepts one of those hazy concepts in Serbian legal practice is the concept of legal principles. Tonight, Martin will tell us from, from a philosophical standpoint, from a standpoint of principles theory, what principles are and how do we reason with principles. So, Martin, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Boyan. I, I agree that uh, legal philosophy becomes terribly pale uh, if you do not see actually how it could change the outcome of any given case. Because at the end of the day, uh, in law, we are doing, uh, to speak, an exercise in practical philosophy. That is, we justify a concrete ought statement and justify actually why a particular ought statement uh, is true. Uh, now I'm approaching the issue of legal principles from the perspective of absolute rights. Because absolute rights are a particular challenge for the theory of legal principles. But uh, the angle from which I'm approaching principles theory, I think, tells you something about the standard uh, model of applying proportionality to constitutional rights. And my aim is to talk here for no longer than kind of an hour and leave some room for discussion. And uh, let me say now, at the beginning, you are cordially invited, uh, of course, to contribute to the discussion and to ask questions. Uh, there is, according to someone uh, I spoke to a couple of years ago, no stupid question. There are no only stupid answers. OK, we shall see. Uh, as mentioned, I'm going to present a reconstruction of so-called absolute rights. And this is a reconstruction I developed in the context of my greater inquiry into the structure of constitutional and human rights, basically uh, over my career, you could say. The main elements of this reconstruction were developed in the second edition of my uh, PhD in 2007. Uh, a couple of things changed in the third edition, 2018, that is recent. These are both German books. Uh, there is, however, an article in English that was published in 2013. This is still, so to speak, um, up to date because there hasn't anything uh, important happened since then. 2013 in the German Yearbook of International Law. 
And the title is the title of tonight's lecture, Absolute Rights and Proportionality. So if you want to recap this lecture or reflect on the topics mentioned here today, this evening, this might be good reading for you. I have a PDF, so don't hesitate to send me an email if you would like to have an electronic copy of it. Okay, absolute rights. So what are they? What is the problem that this actually poses? Certain rights are commonly regarded as absolute sensu stricto. That is to say, they lend themselves neither to limitation nor proportionality analysis. So this is to say absolute, no limits and no proportionality, no balancing. Doesn't have full stop. Following the received opinion, absolute sense of strict to characterize rights found in Article 3 and 4 of the European Convention of Human Rights, Article 1, 4, and 5 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, basically repeating the European Convention. This is nothing significantly different and human dignity according to Article 1.1 of the German Basic Law. This is also in the Charter of Fundamental Rights and European Union. Human dignity. I shall argue, to the contrary, that the basic that these rights, commonly regarded as absolute, are not absolute sensu stricto. Rather, the proportionality analysis that is employed elsewhere and then for the normal rights can and should be used here too. Why so? The merit of the reconstruction of these rights in terms of proportionality analysis is the explanation that it provides, namely why it is that these rights enjoy, for all intents and purposes, an absolute standing. So this is to say they have specific properties that make them look absolute. The dogmatic, not to say a priori character of absolute rights, yields to an understanding of these rights in uh, terms of the very machinery used elsewhere in proportionality analysis. So if you just want a very short compressed statement, what I'm aiming at, uh, that is relative absoluteness. Now, this sounds, of course, like a contradiction in terms, but it is not, as you, I hope, shall see uh, once I have finished my uh, presentation here today. Okay, proportionality analysis, analysis in general. This is widely regarded as a crucial factor in the protection of human rights. It is commonly employed as a substantive criterion for the justification of an interference with the basic right. Proportionality in its broader sense comprises three criteria, suitability, necessity, and proportionality in its narrower sense with the balancing requirement. For the sake of time, I shall refrain from a general analysis and defense of proportionality as a rational method of assessing claims stemming from basic rights and details of this scheme with these three prongs. These issues can, however, be raised in the discussion at the end of tonight's meeting, if desired. By contrast with relative rights, where proportionality and limiting are at play, absolute rights are seen as immune to limitation and also to proportionality analysis. Now, it is frequently assumed in references to absolute rights that everyone knows which rights are absolute. And as mentioned, the articles were already listed. The prohibition of torture, inhuman and degrading treatment, and freedom from slavery, actually, it's Article 4.1 ECHR, and third, human dignity, which is kind of these things in the German understanding and maybe even something more. Now, the key question is, what do these rights have in common that separates them from other rights? And if one looks at the justifications that are given in the context of a right being considered absolute, one encounters formal criteria. 
The first formal criteria that is mentioned, or often mentioned, is that these rights are non-derogable according to Article 15 ECHR. There is a, uh, actually a provision in the European Convention on Human Rights according to which rights can be derogated in terms of national emergency. And there is a list of rights that are non-derogable. There can be no derogation from these rights. So this seems to be something more important than the other rights. And so people tend to think this is actually um, then the justification for these rights being absolute. Now the problem with this formal criterion is that it does not offer a convincing explanation because the list of non-derogable rights in Article 50 ECHR also contains the right to life. The right to life is, without any doubt, something quite important, but there's no suggestion, interestingly, that the right to life should be on the list of absolute rights. So it is something important, it has this formal characteristic of being immune to derogation by means of Article 15 ECHR, but it's not considered absolute. Okay, so this first formal criterion doesn't work. The second candidate uh, for a former candidate for a right as absolute sensu stricto is the fact that the right does not contain a limiting clause. Now, if a right contains a limiting clause, it is pretty obvious that it is amenable to limitation. It can be limited. Now, the idea is if it does not have a limiting clause, then limitation seems not to be possible. And this would be a characteristic, actually, of being absolute sensu stricto. And it's true, it is true that actually the rights mentioned, Article 3 and 4 ECHR mainly, and the German provision on human dignity, which is also in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, do actually not have a limiting clause. The problem is, many other rights do also not have a written limiting clause, and in the interpretation of these other rights, without a written limiting clause, constitutional interpretation has come to the conclusion that an unwritten limiting clause is to be, so to speak, read into the provision, and that the machinery for the rights with a written limiting clause is applied with the very same structure to these rights without a written limiting clause, so to speak, introducing an unwritten limiting clause. Uh, so, uh, I think the search for formal criteria that distinguish absolute rights from uh, rights amenable to limitation and proportionality uh, does actually not offer any convincing solution. My thesis, explained in the article, as mentioned in the beginning, is that the characteristics of rights commonly regarded as absolute are not formal, they are substantive in nature. They are substantive in nature. The substantive characterization is twofold. It's not just one characteristic, it's two characteristics. First, these rights protect particularly important interests of the individual. This is pretty clear within uh, eye to torture. We all have a very strong interest not to be subjected to torture. We all have a very strong interest not to be subjected to slavery, for example. But there is a second characteristic, and this is that for the rights typically considered to be absolute, there is typically no weighty limiting reason at hand. And this explains why their mind, why uh, the right to life is not on the list of absolute rights. It actually um, meets first criteria to be a particularly important interest it ticks that box that's fine but there are there can be um, limiting reasons that actually justify not literally the state uh, killing people 
but actually that the state, so to speak, causing at least some kind of danger that one of its citizens or more of its citizens actually, at the end of the day, might die. And so the characteristic is because the, there is a, a typically very important interest undergirding the right and the typically the limiting reasons, imagine what would be justification nowadays to hold a person in slavery. Can you imagine any legitimate reason? I can't. So the point is, it's, it's a weighty interest and typically no weighty limited reason is at hand so that the difference between the intensity of interference and proportionality and the justification, there is typically a very wide margin. So that even if you contemplate justifying interference, these have to be really extreme and very unusual <coughs> cases. Okay, so this is the basic idea and uh, this is now I hope it explains in greater detail. Seen as such, the idea of absolute rights and stricto seems perfectly plausible. Why not? If there be an interference with an absolute right, it can never be justified. Competing rights and goods are simply irrelevant. Proportionality and balancing play no role. To be sure, if and when absolute rights become an element of a comprehensive system of rights, which contains for the most part relative, limitable rights, then the perspective will change. To begin with, which right yields to which in instances in which two absolute rights compete? Absolute rights sensu stricto take priority by definition over every other competing right or interest. Once it has been determined that there is an interference with the right, everything else has to yield. Full stop. For example, what can be done in a situation in which the dignity of one individual can be respected only if the dignity of another individual is interfered with? Human dignity, both absolute, the competition, you have no criterion to decide which claim wins. It has been suggested in the German discussion on human dignity that a limitation of human dignity by itself well, you, by human dignity of one person, by human dignity of another person, this is man who is by itself, it's unclear actually, is um, uh, mentioned. In, uh, and then of course proportionality is supposed to decide uh, which a human dignity claim prevails. In short, this is nothing more than the admission that human dignity as an individual's legal position is actually not absolute. Because in that special situation, they are happy to apply proportionality analysis. This is only, so to speak, a limitation of the set of limiting reasons. You limit the set of limiting reasons of absolute rights to all other potentially competing absolute <laughs> rights. This is nothing else. The idea of absolute rights as a part of a comprehensive system of rights, most of which are relative rights, raises the question, of course, of whether the absolute priority of every absolute right in every instance, these are the every relative right, priority under all imaginable circumstances, strikes one as reasonable. Thus, every interference with an absolute right, however marginal, justify foregoing the protection of competing relative rights, no matter how severe the consequences might be. Is it reasonable, for example, to conceive of every right commonly understood as absolute as outweighing the right to life, whatever the circumstances and the number of individuals affected? Question. If the substantive characterization, which I have just introduced a couple of minutes ago, of those rights usually regarded as absolute is correct, it suggests that they be understood as subject to proportionality and balance. From the substantive point of view, to repeat, rights commonly regarded as absolute protect particularly important interests 
with limiting reasons that are typically far removed from justifying interference with the right. This is to say that the interest undergirding the right is particularly weighty and that the individual, the typical limiting reasons, sorry, are usually far less weighty. Now, even if these rights are subjected to proportionality analysis, the result in typical circumstances is clear. The interest undergirding the right prevails, and it does so with such certainty that any express justification appears superfluous. So we have here actually, in terms of legal reasoning, a plain case of balancing. Some people tend to insinuate that balancing is always open, everyone can come to a completely different result in terms of balancing, so that all cases of balancing are actually hard cases of legal argumentation. But I think this here shows that there are clearly plain cases where you can't really reasonably disagree on the Result. Still, in exceptional circumstances, it may appear less certain, such that an explicit justification might seem advisable, an explicit balancing judgment. In extreme circumstances, it might be the case that a right commonly regarded as absolute proves actually to be limited, particularly if the scope is understood not too narrowly although the possibility is, so to speak, reduced very much by what follows now in the remainder of my argument. Now, it militates on behalf of the relative reading, so to speak, my suggestion here, uh, of all rights that all structural problems of absolute rights, sensu stricto, vanish. All structural problems are gone. They are, so to speak, in terms of structure, they share the same structure as limitable rights subject to proportionality. They are only special, well, only isn't a bit um, soft. They are, of course, special, but their speciality is justified in terms of substantive uh, properties. The problem of competing so-called absolute rights can be resolved from the structural point of view by balancing these rights as with all the other uh, rights, and uh, these are hard cases there. These are uh, the hard cases of balancing if two claims from human dignity compete. To be sure, balancing provides a structure in which normative problems can be decided in an open and transparent manner. The more controversial, actually, a normative justification is, the more important it is that it is, so to speak, placed front, uh, uh, center stage, that it is front and center, that actually make open and transparent uh, on which assumptions uh, you base your result. In addition, the hardly reasonable assumption that every absolute right takes priority over every relative right, right in every instance disappears without a trace, it's just gone because uh, even so-called absolute rights can be balanced. The strict priority, the technically strict and absolute priority of absolute rights over relative rights is replaced by a very strong prima facie priority of absolute rights. So there is still some priority, although it is not the technical absolute, but it's a very strong substantive assumption on behalf of the absolute rights. Strong, substantively strong, but surmountable in exceptional cases. Still, even the relative, still, even if the relative reading of the rights commonly regarded as absolute should avoid a number of problems, of course, one pressing question remains. And the pressing question is actually the reason why, to be honest, it took quite some time before I was happy uh, to publish. Uh, a suggestion along these lines. We need an answer to this question. And the question is, does this suggestion, what I have referred to as relative absolute, the substantive characterization, the substantive prima facie character 
as opposed to the formal absolute character, does it not tend to undermine the protection granted by these rights? Or, to put an even sharper edge on it, does it play into the hands of torturers and torture apologetics? This is the problem. Before the relative freedom of absolute rights is unfolded in greater detail, it would be well to emphasize that the relative freedom of the rights commonly regarded as absolute, proposed here in this lecture, is neither intended to weaken the protection these rights provide, nor does it, in fact, I think, weaken them. Even if the rights commonly regarded as absolute were to lose their structural characteristic being technically immune to proportionality analysis, their substantive characteristics, paramount abstract weight, and typically far less weighty limiting reasons would remain. These substantive characteristics would continue to distinguish, for example, Article 3 for ECHR, 145 Charter Fundamental Rights, Article 1 Basic Law, would distinguish all these rights from all the other paradigmatic relative rights which do not have that strong prima facie uh, assumption uh, in their favor. It is widely recognized that the rights commonly regarded as absolute deserve a particularly high level of protection and this universally accepted conviction is to be taken seriously. A relative reading is suggested here to offer a more convincing reconstruction of this high level of protection. It is not offered to change the results of the common understanding. And I will refer to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights later, and uh, I can simply tell you in plain words that I'm perfectly happy with the result of basically every decision the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg has taken. Um, not with the uh, justification. This is my point here tonight. Okay, this needs to be emphasized that uh, I actually do not want to support torture apologetics. Uh, and uh, yeah, why? Because the relative freedom of absolute rights might also be employed as a means in what I shall term a debate that is result-oriented. This was for me, so to speak, the key, having understood this, to, um, to publish something on that. Re what's a result-oriented debate? A result-oriented debate is characterized by the effort to justify the result that departs from the received opinion. Let us say that someone is simply convinced or has a strong intuition to the effect that in certain life-threatening situations, state action that would usually be classified as an instance of torture can be justified. The Gefke case, which was decided by the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights in June 2010, may serve as an example. A law student in Frankfurt, Magnus Gefke, kidnapped an 11-year-old boy, Jakob von Metzler, holding him for ransom money. So instead of pursuing a law career, he decided actually to become a criminal, which is not a great idea for all sorts of reasons. After taking the ran ransom, so he received the money, the law student was apprehended by the police. The police had assumed that the boy was still alive, and that he was, of course, in imminent danger, possibly dying of thirst, helplessly locked away in a hideout. He <coughs> refused to reveal the boy's whereabouts. The police chief of Frankfurt, Wolfgang Daschner, it's also referred to as the Daschner case, Wolfgang Daschner threatened the suspect with intolerable pain inflicted by a special police squad already underway in a helicopter and under medical supervision. 
not some kind of medieval torture with iron, so, but, but kind of a modern version that was uh, to be taken seriously by the um, uh, by Agefke. Having been exposed to the threats for roughly 10 minutes, well, this was uh, what was proven in the court case. There were allegations by uh, Gefgen that were actually additional threats that I hesitate to mention here in public, um, but um, there's a footnote in the, um, in the judgment that refers to that. It's not my kind of special knowledge. So this was um, um, what could be proved. Having exposed to the threats for roughly 10 minutes, Gefgen revealed the location of the corpse. The boy had died earlier of suffocation, unfortunately. The case sparked a lively debate on how far the police are allowed to go in a situation in which it is reasonable to assume that the life of an innocent victim may well be in imminent danger. According to the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, the treatment to which Gefgen was exposed amounted to inhuman treatment and fell afoul to Article 3 ECHR. This is technically not torture, it's inhuman treatment for the sake of, so to speak, simplicity. I refer in the lecture here to, to that uh, classification as some instance of torture. In a result oriented debate, now this is the point, the outcome of the case is taken as the Archimedean point. A paradigmatic statement in a result oriented debate on the Gifkin case might read as follows. Quote, in the Gefgen case, Dashner's cause of action, threatening the suspect, must be omitted. Close quote. Those who support this thesis and disagree with the result of the Grand Chamber judgment can choose now between two strategies to explain why, according to their opinion, the treatment to which Gefgen was exposed does not violate Article 3 ECHR. They can claim first that the treatment as such is not an instance of torture or inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, according to Article 3 ECHR in the first place. They can say this is something, you know, in the American debate on mistreating um, <coughs> prisoners of all sorts, uh, this euphemism of forced interrogation uh, has become notorious in reference to treatment such as waterfalls, where someone is treated in a way that makes him believe and feel that you uh, drown. And drowning is a particularly nasty way of uh, dying. This is the first strategy. So that it wasn't conceptually, so to speak, not uh, qualifies, not on uh, these counts. Or secondly, there actually is an instance of uh, such treatment, torture and human degrade treatment, but that it is, as an exception, justified in the circumstances of the case at hand. Now, it is clear, it is a necessary element of the second strategy that the absolute nature of Article 3 ECHR be denied. If an exception or limitation can be made, this right cannot, by definition, be absolute. This is to say that the relative nature of a certain right may well become a part of a result-oriented debate. Where it does, however, it serves only as a means to an end. As a means of supporting a certain outcome in the case that is taken as given from the outset. The key problem of this strategy, some people proceed in this way, the key problem of this strategy is whether the conviction regarding the outcome of the case the Archimedean point of the results of the oriented debate can be justified because this is the result of the legal argumentation. Whether something is justified, it's not the starting point. Apart from this general problem, there are, however, serious doubts as to whether a relative reading of Article 3 ECHR really can support the thesis of these uh, people who are torture apologetics, who have this means to an end use of this relative reading. And this is relative absoluteness, the substantive characteristics, as mentioned and as explained further. Good. Now I, I turn to relative absoluteness in greater detail, at least for some time here. Uh, to explain this a bit more, uh, is this actually a convincing solution to assume that these rules 
on um, this strong prima facie assumption uh, solve the problem. Rules on attributing weight to competing principles with rising severity of interference and the consideration of the certainty of empirical <coughs> premises, these two elements, serve to explain why it is mistaken to suppose that subjecting absolute rights to proportionality analysis would diminish their significance. There are two key ideas. The disproportionately rising weight with rising interference, disproportionately rising, and the role of the certainty of empirical premises. Empirical premises are related to the facts of the case. How certain do we know the facts of the case? These are the two key aspects. To begin with, this has already been mentioned, rights commonly regarded as absolutes have a particularly high abstract weight. This is the first part of the substantive characterization. Second, in, the, in balancing the relation between the interference, sorry, between the intensity of interference and the weight of the relevant principle is not proportional. That is, to justify a more severe interference with a right, one requires a justification far stronger than merely a proportionately stronger <coughs> justification. If you want a met metaphor, if you have a balloon, a rubber balloon that is filled with air. If you, if you press it, at the beginning it's quite easy. But the more you have already compressed it, the more difficult it becomes to compress it even more. It's a kind of rising resistance um, compared to um, what was required at the beginning. This phenomenon is the more pronounced, the higher the abstract weight of the relevant right. If you get to know Robert Alexis' weight formula, I don't know whether we have time to talk about this or whether we want to talk about this, but he has um, a geometric sequence, a geometric sequence in the values of the weight formula that actually precisely is there because of this disproportionate rise, disproportionately rising interference. So this is not, so to speak, something that occurred to me uh, at some point. Uh, but th this is something that is uh, present in the debate on uh, how to model uh, these uh, things in balancing. This is a known issue of rights. Good. This is to say that the only limiting reasons that come even close to outweigh these rights characterized that way are those of truly outstanding importance. And this is the third, the first, sorry, the first issue. The second is severe interferences have to be based on empirical premises that are certain. Very severe interferences have to be based on very certain empirical premises. And these intuitions suggest the following. The more severe the interference with the right, the greater the required certainty of the empirical premises. And the idea of the disproportionate increase applies here too, underlying this argument even more. So, the more severe the interference and the higher the absolute weight of the relevant right, the disproportionately greater certainty of empirical premises. This is to say, to put this in more plain English, this is to say that the interference with the rights commonly regarded as absolute, for which a particularly high absolute weight is characteristic, can only be justified by limiting reasons with truly outstanding weight and on the basis of absolutely certain empirical premises. The crucial role of the certainty of empirical premises in balancing can also be illustrated by an analysis of the notorious ticking time bomb case. This is a kind of standard case uh, on this issue. It usually runs something like that. 
the apologetics of, on torture uh, refer typically to an artificial case in which a terrorist has planted a bomb and the terrorist who has planted the bomb is the only one who can defuse this ticking time bomb in time. The facts of this case vary, but they are always arranged in such a way as to lead to a great many casualties unless the terrorist is subjected to measures that are usually classified as torture. The idea is to orchestrate the situation in a way that the prohibition of torture is juxtaposed with competing rights and interests that are as weighty as possible. And then a rhetorical question is supposed to emerge who would not be prepared to endorse some mild form of torture, of interrogation maybe, when so many lives are at stake. Now, the following is important. Such hypothetical or artificial cases have very little in common with real cases. All empirical uncertainties are simply removed by way of hypothetical assumption. The terrorist is the terrorist, not a suspected terrorist. It is certain that no one else can defuse the bomb in a timely fashion. It is certain that the terrorist will disclose the crucial information under some allegedly mild form of torture. It is certain that this information will save a great many lives, which cannot be achieved in a, uh, by a different means, and so on. The introduction of these empirical assumptions do not count as a simplification. Rather, they change the case fundamentally. The role of the certainty of empirical premises in balancing explains why hypothetical or artificial scenarios tell us very little how to decide real cases. The idea of relative absoluteness of the high level of protection for some rights brought about by balancing is not simply a theoretical idea. In the case of the German Federal Constitutional Court, one finds two different strands of argument in assessing claims stemming from human dignity. The first strand is the absolute strand. In these judgment, judgments, the court explicitly rules out any proportionality analysis or balancing of human dignity. And the second strand is relative. Here the court actually uses arguments that are characteristic for proportionality analysis. In some cases, you find even both strands in the very same judgment. For example, the judgment on the statutory empowerment to shoot down passenger aircrafts in cases of terroristic attacks. And we can talk a bit more about this case if you wish in our discussion. It is admitted that the relativity of the prohibition of torture in human degrading treatment of um, Article 3 ECHR, to which the court in Strasbourg repeatedly referred, goes in the same relative direction. I come back soon to that case law. To illustrate the plausibility of the idea of relative absoluteness, it is well to revisit the Gefgen case. What changes if this approach is compared with the traditional understanding of absolute rights? In line with the traditional understanding of the case of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, the Grand Chamber, in the Gefgen case, emphasizes the absolute nature of Article 3 ECHR and explicitly rules out any balancing of interests. If, however, one applies proportionality, does the outcome change? Does the fact that the life of a child was supposedly at stake justified the treatment to which Gavkin was subjected. It is plausible to assume that the treatment accorded to Gavkin amounted to in interference of Article 3 ECHR. Gavkin was in police custody, handcuffed, and this represents, as the um, Strasbourg court said, quote, a situation of particular vulnerability and constraint, close quote. In this situation, he was threatened with unbearable pain, 
which was to be inflicted upon if failed if he failed to reveal the whereabouts of the missing boy, and this was given the situation credible to to give him. It was not uh, unrealistic or something like that. According to the Grand Chamber, the real and immediate threats of deliberate and imminent ill treatment to which the applicant was subjected during his interrogation must be regarded as having caused him considerable fear, anguish, and mental suffering. There can be little doubt that this counts as a very severe interference with his interests, and this is, of course, supported by the idea of the absolute nature of some kind of unhuman treatment or torture in police custody. The responsible police officer, Dushner, pursued the end of saving the life of the missing boy. In principle, of course, the boy's right to life, Article 2 ECHR, served as a limiting reason. This is, no doubt, a legitimate end. Problems begin already at the suitability level of the proportionality analysis, for one has to have reservations about the reliability of confessions extracted with the help of torture or inhuman treatment. What is more, the question as to whether a less restrictive means was available arises at the necessity level. Okay, we may assume, however, that the treatment uh, promoted the aim at least to some extent and had no alternative cause of action that was available that would have been compar comparably uh, efficient, e efficacious. In this case, the balancing is decisive. The interference with Gavgen's right not to be subjected to inhuman treatment according to Article 3 ECHR is very severe, and the negative effects, now this is the point, were absolutely certain. If you torture someone, the negative effects, the traumatization, is certain. Some are more traumatized, some, so to speak, get away with less problems after this, but you know uh, that the detrimental effect is there, this is safe. The presumption against such interference can be rebutted only if extraordinary limiting reasons are forthcoming. In substantive terms, the life of a child is of inestimable value, no doubt about that. However, now the problem is, it was far from certain that torturing, or technically inhuman treatment, Giefgen would save actually the life of the boy. The police officers could not be absolutely certain whether they had the right man in custody. This was their suspicion. They could not be certain that Gefke knew where the boy was hidden. Maybe he had accomplices and he, was, he didn't know that. And uh, he, uh, of course, the police uh, could not be sure that the boy was still alive. Taking all of these empirical uncertainties together, Dushner's course of action appears to have been an act of desperation rather than reflecting a sound empirical basis. This tips the balance decisively in favor of Gaefgen, whether you like him or not, and his right according to Article 3 ECHR. And this can be generalized, where two particularly important substantive interests, such as the interest to life and the interest not to be subjected to torture in human integrating treatment, compete where these compete. The certainty of the empirical premises very often decides the outcome. Because the negative effects of torture and human degrading treatment are absolutely certain, it is hardly imaginable to regard Article 3 ECHR as ever being outlet. Finally, the question arises as to whether uncoupling proportionality and limitation might serve as a kind of compromise between absolute and relative rights. This is Robert Alexi's way of approaching this. Uh, and he developed principles theory, so it is actually well to have a look uh, at his solution on that front. It has been mentioned that where paradigmatically limitable rights are applied, proportionality analysis is conducted at the level of the justification of the interference. That is, in determining whether a right is limited. One could, however, think of using proportionality elsewhere in the scheme of the assessment of rights claims as a criterion for the determination whether there is an interference with the right in the first place. 
Does this give rise to an absolute right because illimitable that is susceptible to proportionality analysis? So not limitable, but in some sense subject to proportionality analysis. This is the uncoupling. The only difference here, this is the short answer, and I will give you a more detailed one. Uh, the only difference is that the limitation is hidden, takes place, but it's hidden. Uh, and this is the strategy that is referred to in the debate on balancing as definitional balancing. Uh, you, you balance already uh, when you determine the definition of the concept. That uncoupling proportionality and limitation will well be more than a theoretical construct can be illustrated now by the case law of the European Court of Rights in Strasbourg and the German Federal Constitutional Court. And I will say a couple of words on Robert Alexis' reconstruction of human dignity. It has already been mentioned that the determination of the scope of absolute rights sensu stricto carries the whole burden of their assessment and that there is a tendency towards a narrow scope. It does not come as a surprise, therefore, that only serious maltreatment of individuals can amount to interference with Article 3 ECHR. In the old case of Ireland and United Kingdom, the Strasbourg Court characterized the threshold of severity to where the scope begins, where the interference scope begins, that characterized the threshold of severity as relative. And that is interesting because relative is often used as a keyword when balancing is it. it depends on all the circumstances of the case, such as the duration of the treatment, its physical or mental effects, and in some cases, the sex, age, and state of health of the victim. The court has repeated this formula in numerous decisions ever since, so it's still good case law. Against the backdrop of the dichotomy of absolute and relative, it is suggested that the expression relative be read as referring to a balancing exercise. This seems to be confirmed in Zöring, a later case, where the court stated, quote, what amounts to inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment depends on all the circumstances of the case, close quote. Referring to the passage in the judgment, Island United Kingdom, where the uh, relativity formula is used. The court continues in Zürich. Furthermore, inherent in the whole of the convention is a search for a fair balance. Fair balance between the demands of the general interests of the community and the requirements of the protection of the individual's fundamental rights." Close quote. By contrast, now, the court stated later in Shahal, it is a British case, the ECHR, that, quote, it should not be inferred from the court's remarks concerning the risk of undermining the foundations of extradition, as set out in paragraph 89 of Zürich that there is any room for balancing the risk of ill-treatment against the reasons for expulsion in determining whether a state's responsibility under Article 3 is engaged. So they basically use language in Zürich where that refers to balancing, and in Shahal, then the court says, well, no, we didn't. That was reinforced in Zadi, where the the quote, argument based on the balancing of the risk of harm if the person is sent back, exhibition case, sent back against the dangerousness he or she represents to the community if not sent back. And balancing these things, then the court says, is misconceived. No, no, we don't want that. What is more, one reads in Gevgen, Gevgen is 2010, the philosophical basis underpinning the absolute nature of the right under Article 3 does not allow for any exception or justification, justifying factors or balancing of interests, close quote. Um, but the court doesn't actually explain these philosophical underpinnings. This is just, so to speak, a reference uh, into nothing, philosophical. Okay, with an eye to the case law of the Strasbourg Court, 
commentators are divided, while the relativity of the scope has been understood as a reference to balancing, others have objected to this reading. A full analysis of the court's case law goes, however, well beyond the scope of this lecture. Suffice it to say that the following two reconstructions are germane. First, the court uses proportionality analysis for the determination of whether there is interference with Article 3 scope. This is to say that the required severity of treatment depends on the weight of competing rights or interests. In this case, Article 3 ECHR is absolute in the sense that the right cannot be expressly limited. It is, however, relative in the sense that proportionality analysis is part of the assessment of the rights claim. Secondly, the competing interpretation, the court does not use proportionality balancing in the application of Article 3, not as a criterion for limitation and not in the determination of whether there is an interference with the right either. So it doesn't use this then at all. Article 3, with a second reading, is absolute in every sense. Neither a limitation nor the application of proportionality is possible. Now, interestingly, the relativity formula as such permits both readings. When we do legal interpretation, we usually interpret provisions. But here we have a formula from the case law, and also a formula from the case law can be subject to interpretation. And this is what precisely happens here. Which reconstruction is correct depends on how this formula is actually applied. Zöring points in the relative direction, Schahal in the absolute direction. The court's formulation in Gäfgen is not altogether conclusive because they only rule out proportionality in limitation, but don't say anything on proportionality in determining actually the scope. So this is, doesn't tell us much. You have to read these uh, arguments carefully. Good. Um, <coughs> admittedly, it is not easy to claim that the court balances the severity of the interference against competing rights and interests if the court emphasized in Shahal that it does not, at least in one of the two senses. It is, in any case, hard to imagine that the court is completely unimpressed by competing rights and principles in the assessment of claims involving Article 3 ECHR, and this points in some sense toward the relative construction. Just a short remark, because the ECTHR is more important for you, the case law of the German Constitutional Court also has these two strands. It has a, an absolute strand where it emphasizes, oh, we can't balance here, this proportionality doesn't work, full stop. And you have also a relative strand where they actually do it. And you can see from the arguments used that they, that they do it. Okay. Mm, now, the case law of the European Court of Rights in Strasbourg is difficult to interpret. It is more clear, actually, Robert Alexi, because he has a clear model. The model has, however, I think, problems. In an attempt to reconcile the absolute with the relative strand in the case of the German Federal Constitutional Court, Robert Alexi distinguishes between two elements of human dignity, the human dignity principle and the human dignity rule. He emphasizes the, quote, semantic open texture of the concept of human dignity, close quote. And he's certainly right about that. Many people, people understand many different things when they refer to human dignity. Now, according to Alexi, the human dignity rule establishes the definitive protection granted by Article 1.1 Basic Law. The human dignity principle undergirds the human dignity rule and the principle, human dignity principle, is balanced against competing rights or interests. And the result of balancing the human dignity principle with competing rights and goods yields the result of 
the human dignity. Quote, the preference relation between the human dignity principle and other competing principles determines the content of the human dignity rule. Close quote. According to Alexis Principles theory, the application of principles necessarily requires proportionality analysis. The advantage of his reconstruction, Alexis concludes, is now again a short quotation, is that, quote, on one hand, no limiting clause needs to be read into the human dignity norm of the Constitution, but that, on the other hand, the human dignity principle can still be balanced with other constitutional principles. Close quote. In short, one can have proportionality analysis without limitation. So he thinks. And this is a plain case of definitional balancing. This model of implicit proportionality analysis in the assessment of rights, right claims invoking human dignity, renders Article 1.1 Absolute in some sense, in the sense that once the human dignity rule has been established, no exception, no justification, no balancing is possible. It presupposes human dignity as relative, however, insofar as the principle of human dignity is balanced according to proportionality. Now, if Robert Alexi considers implicit proportionality analysis, definitional balancing, as advantageous, To the, the question rises as to why it ought to be advantageous for human dignity, but not for other constitutional rights, where we still have the established scheme of limitation and proportionality analysis applied in the justification of a limitation, rather than definitional balancing at the stage of the scope of the work. For example, if people are barred from attending religious services owing to an imminent pandemic, an illness, one might ask whether a principle of religious freedom and a rule of religious freedom ought to be distinguished, the latter being absolute in nature. So you could just try to use this construction for all fundamental rights. The principle of religious freedom, the principle, needs to be balanced against competing principles in the circumstances of the case at hand, in the case of an imminent pandemic, public health. Public health, in these cases, outweighs religious freedom, so that people have no definitive right to attend religious services. How does this reconstruction, according to implicit proportionality analysis, differ from the reconstruction according to the standard model of limitable rights? It is crucial to understand that the application of proportionality to rights is in both cases precisely the same. A prima facie right, the principle, is balanced against competing rights and interests, and the outcome of the balancing is the definitive right. It's just in different places of the scheme. The only difference is that the standard model of limitable rights focuses on the prima facie right and on the justification of interferences while well, Alexis' reconstruction of human dignity, implicit proportionality analysis, places the definitive right center stage. One could say that if judges were to follow Alexis' model of human dignity, it would be less obvious that they are performing proportionality rights. To put a sharp edge on it, is it advantageous to hide the fact that proportionality analysis takes place in assessing claims stemming from basic rights. Considering that it is regarded a crucial advantage of proportionality analysis, that it sheds light on the relevant premises and particularly on the justification of the weight of competing principles, the answer must be negative. An additional aspect not to be forgotten that uh, is the issue of formal criteria such as prescribed by law in the requirements for justification of interferences with the right, required by law. There are no formal criteria in Alexis' model of implicit proportionality analysis for human dignity. This is to say that the executive or the judiciary 
does not require any prior authorization by parliamentary statute to consider the principle of human dignity as being outweighed in a given case. If, that's the point, if paradigmatically, typically, limitable rights, Article 8 to 11 ECHR, for example, Religious Freedom 9, 10 is um, uh, freedom of expression, 8 is the right to private life. If these all rights require such prior, or prior authorization by a parliamentary statute, and the parliament is democratically directly legitimate, this is the point, the special quality of a parliamentary statute. If they require this prior authorization formal, why would so called absolute rights, such as human dignity, which are characterized by higher weight than not required? This is a contradiction. In, in terms of the evaluation. Thus, if one follows Alexis' model, the criterion prescribed by law needs to be read into this implicit model of analysis. And if one does this, the structural parallels become even more obvious. So there is no point in actually uh, doing this implicit uh, proportionality analysis. We should just stay with a tested and proven explicit scheme. To complete this section and nearly this lecture, using uh, uncoupling, so uncoupling proportionality and limitation does not give rise to a new structural model of basic rights that is uh, a good idea. The main difference by comparison with the standard model is that the limitation of the prima facie rate is hidden rather than explicitly acknowledged and justified. Because rendering the balancing and the arguments in support of it transparent is a crucial advantage of proportionality analysis. The shift in the focus that results from implicit analysis is unfortunate. Bad idea. I come to the conclusion. Is the idea of proportionality analysis in the application of so-called absolute rights, such as Article 3 ECHR, a wrong term, as Stephanie Palmer from Cambridge has uh, mentioned in an article in the debate? There are good reasons to doubt this. In fact, the results most of us regard as correct can be better reconstructed by means of balancing. And the role of the certainty of empirical premises in balancing explains why hypothetical or artificial scenarios tell us very little about how to decide real cases. If all this is true, it suggests itself to replace blanket absoluteness in the form of a category of absolute rights sense of scripto, with all the paradoxes and problems it creates with a relative reading of the rights commonly regarded to be absolute, some form of absoluteness as a result of proportionality analysis, or short, as mentioned already, relative absoluteness. Thanks for your kind attention thus far. You are now cordially invited to ask questions. Considering the case of the student farmers, the policeman only threatened him that he will be tortured. Yeah. Okay. So what I am thinking is, it's all up to his subjective, uh, the subjective way of how he experienced that threat. Yeah. We cannot say, okay, that is a torture. Maybe if he truly is a sociopathic character. Maybe it uh, did not torture him at all, that which he did. What I am saying is that in that particular case, I believe that the fact that they did torture it, actually it was on human uh, activity, whatever, uh, is not that uh, strange. Why? Because, for example, if that was all uh, compressed, if maybe that student Magnus was holding a kid with a uh, gun to his head, the police would have uh, the power to shoot him. Maybe shoot him in the leg, shoot him in the shoulder, but they would have power to inflict pain upon him in order to save the life of the kid. So what I'm saying is that what happened here is actually some sort of maybe an immediate defense, necessary defense of life only stretched out in time. Why can you shoot someone 
and not maybe threaten him and not feel it and threaten him with torture. I would say you can torture him as well. If you can shoot him, you can torture him. Why not? Yeah. Uh, the obvious answer uh, is uh, that the uh, scenario that you refer to, uh, in which you, I think, correctly uh, hinted uh, at the uh, power of the police to shoot, uh, that this is a case in which the empirical premises are certain. Because you see him, and you know you are not uh, actually um, shooting the wrong guy. And you, and you know you know the situation more sure. Now, this is, this is so to speak, uh, the obvious and first level of my answer. Um, I, I agree that uh, the Gavkin case, there would also be a, a different case, the shooting down passenger aircraft case, which is also an interesting case, and doesn't have this problem. Um, we have to rely, uh, you say, he, he, he may be a sociopathic character, who probably and he maybe he enjoys being threatened uh, and and uh, so uh, well the point is we have no we have no evidence for that and uh, we have to uh, rely on uh, psychologists basically uh, to uh, to understand and to make reasonable assumptions on the effects of such situations uh, on human beings and on their well, this sounds a bit whinging, well-being, and he had so much fear, and at the end of the day, it is correct, he, as it turned out later, he was re responsible for, for the death of the boy. It turned out to be the case. But, you know, what actually was the case was some kind of middle scenario. It turned out to be true that he, that he was a criminal. It turned out to be the case that he was involved in the abduction. It turned out to be the case that he actually was the, I think he was the only criminal involved, so he did it all himself. But uh, Gifkin did know at the time, didn't know at the time that the boy uh, was, was not alive. If he had known this, he probably had not revealed, which is a speculation. But at the end of the day, we have to rely on, on, um, on experts and on evidence, uh, what people tell us about the severity of interference. I have never been subjected to any kind of torture on human degrading treatment. I cannot say myself whether I would be, so to speak, resistant to this kind of situation if I'm uh, exposed to it. I don't know. I, I have an assumption, but this is perfect, perfectly my own assumption, and it may, may prove to be wrong. And maybe we overestimate or underestimate ourselves. I, I don't know. Um, but uh, this is at least, well, okay. Um, there is an explicit rule in, in, with a categoric uh, formulation in the, in the German constitution that rules uh, explicitly, absolutely, according to the wording, out mistreatment in police custody. Now the difference I can see from where you, uh, where you're coming from. Uh, typically, police custody uh, is is not um, in, in, in in German administrative law in in police law. You would distinguish between uh, the repressive function of the police and the preventive function of the police. Repressive is basically has to do with criminals. Criminals have committed a crime and they are now to be punished. And it may well be that this kind of paradigmatic standard type prohibition of mistreatment in police custody basically says that um, mistreatment of the people that are imprisoned uh, is forbidden because uh, the, the, the state's claim to punishment if someone committed a crime is not actually justification for that kind of thing. It may be that this kind of this is repressive, yeah, uh, punishing criminals. Now, the preventive function is to prevent damage from, from happening in the future. The repressive function, in some sense, always is the prevention of later criminal acts, to some sense. But, but you can distinguish it, and it may be that the justification on that front is weaker, and uh, you are definitely not alone. 
you probably don't know whether it's important for you or not, but uh, you are definitely not alone in the sense that uh, the judgment was actually controversial. And uh, the um, Gefgen won the European uh, court case. And there were people quite unhappy about this. And he actually won then in the second round and he actually received financial compensation. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this was, this was controversial, but maybe, maybe from that point of view, uh, the, the case shooting down passenger aircraft is, is, is a better case. However, I said I, it's not my plan, so to speak, it's not my normative intuition to change the outcome of cases, but I'm perfectly aware if you, if you uh, suggest changing the reconstruction of the justification, this may actually lead to a debate whether this case was decided correctly. And the, the debate was there. Yeah? There was a faction in the debate that took your point of view, saying, well, no, this, is, this absolute thing is, 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 is too strong. And uh, I think this is also something that is to be taken seriously. Thank you. Are there serious debates about including um, rights to life in this kind of like uh, few really absolute rights that you can say like absolute? No. How is that possible? I mean, isn't it like I have a feeling that all those absolute rights um, about um, which you were talking in the beginning, they're kind of like leftovers if we exclude rights to life. Well, how is this possible? How is this possible? When the convention I've seen, is it uh, on this topic or a different topic? Yeah, it's actually an answer. I'm raising the answer. It's an answer, okay. I'm actually answering it in my own cabin. There's very few answers, though. I okay. You, you can't even know. I don't know. Um, this is, you know, the, the shooting down passenger aircraft case is this interesting on that count. Uh, just, just briefly, uh, the German army or the German police did never shoot down a passenger aircraft, and they have no intention of doing it. There was a debate when the um, Luftsicherheitsgesetz, Aviation Safety Statute or Act, was uh, renewed anyway. There was some kind of amendment necessary. And people said, "Well, look at the 9/11 situation. The 9/11 situation." is a situation where a plane is hijacked with crew and passengers, uh, typically uh, directly after takeoff because the plane is full of kerosene. You take the passenger airplanes that are these long distance airplanes because they are basically flying kerosene tanks. And if you want to destroy a ground target, you hit the plane to the ground target and the kerosene basically owing to the energy uh, with the with the, um, the airplane, and actually, as it turned out, with the World Trade Center, I think the aluminium of the airplane plays a role too in destroying this building. So you create dramatic uh, damage. And the Germans thought, well, it might be necessary to shoot down a passenger aircraft in this situation. And being uh, proper and um, uh, yeah, proper uh, Germans who believe in the rule of law, they said we need to have a law of that. So there needs to be a statutory. Um, empowerment of the police uh, to shoot down passenger aircraft in this situation. We actually have a statute on um, the police, the legitimate police killings in this situation of imminent danger of a, a, um, a victim. Yeah, we have a statute for that too in the uh, state police laws. So this is kind of normal debate. No one wants to do it, but if you don't have a statute, you can't do it because it has to be prescribed by law. So you need an authorization for doing it. And so uh, this um, empowerment was uh, put in place directly to that point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one side we had 3,000 people die. Uh, the airplane hit the, the uh, North Tower and 15 minutes later hit the uh, South Tower of the World Trade Center. Yeah. But they put down the airplanes before he hit yep. the building. Yep. You will 
probably have the more that the less that cause uh, less uh, the small damage uh, effect you have three three thousand people die in those effects. Yeah. You know what I was when I was teaching in Birmingham. Another reason or brother is in that I know. Maybe <laughs> it's it's <laughs> difficult. It's a, it's a wonderful summary. It's difficult. Um, my point, of course, would be no surprise for you on that front. Um, how certain are you about which kind of your assumption? Now, I have to say, uh, the German court declared the um, uh, disempowerment unconstitutional. And I really had a hard time explaining that to British students. Because the British students tend to be utilitarians. And they just say, well, look, 3,000 people on the ground in the building, 200 people in the airplane. If the plane crashes into the house, 3,200 people die. If we shoot down the passenger aircraft, 200 people die. Sounds like a good deal. We'll start. <laughs> uh, interestingly, now it seems that I have departed from your question. I have not. Why? Um, because in that case, the German Federal Constitutional Court is being between the terrorists and um, the passengers and the crew. Passengers and crew are, so to speak, one, one set of people. Uh, and the Federal Constitutional Court said, well, the terrorists are the attackers. If you shoot down the airplane, you are not using the criminals as a means to an end of saving the people on the ground. Which is weird, because at the same time, in terms of argument, in terms of evaluation, it's perfectly fine. Shoot down these people. I pull the trigger. Um, but but what, is, what is, so to speak, interesting is they said they are not using, so to speak, killing the criminals as a means to an end of saving the people on the ground. Of course they do, technically. They said using shooting down the airplane means that the passengers and the crew are being used as a mere means to an end of saving the people on the ground, and you are absolutely prohibited from doing that. Which I think is not a strong argument. Now, why do I like this judgment? Uh, I like it because it shows when you want the result that you are not supposed to shoot it down, you refer to human dignity. Although these people are killed. If you want to, sh if you want to permit the terrorists of being killed, you say, well, this is not human dignity. This is just the right to life, which is subject to proportionality analysis. So there's definitely something strategic going on on that front. Why do I like that judgment? Everyone says this is a judgment that shows that the absolute line of reasoning of the Federal Constitutional Court is correct, because they use this human dignity means to an end argument for passengers and, and crew. But they have, this is the first line of reasoning, they have a second strand, which no one reads anymore, because the thing has already been decided. And this line of reasoning basically says, well, even if you were to consider justifying shooting that down, you could never do it on the basis of such uncertain premises. Because what, what, might, what could happen? All sorts of things could happen. This is our little debate. It could happen that the terrorists actually try to hit the ground target, but they do not manage to hit the ground target. Try to, with, with an airplane, if you're not a trained pilot, you may have a license or done some simulator or flight simulator, Microsoft PC stuff, and try to hit the, a, a, a skyscraper with an airplane. With 400 kilometers per hour, it is not so easy. It may be that actually the passengers, this is the fourth flight at 9-11, the passengers actually attacked the terrorists and the plane went down. So this is, so to speak, the chance of the passengers to do something, to, to, to speak, not to be shot down passively, but do something, so to speak, take their fate in their own hands and to deprive them of the chance of doing that. So all sorts of things can happen so that shooting down the aircraft does not become causal, causal causality for the people on the ground of being able to continue their life. 
And I think because of the uncertainty, as the federal court said in the second line of reasoning, I think they are correct in not permitting to shoot uh, them down. However, one thing, I'm, I'm happily admit one thing. If we could be perfectly sure, if we could be perfectly sure that by shooting down these 200 people, that will be certainly killed. We prevent the same people from being killed two minutes later in the impact, and additionally being 3,000 people being killed. Then, frankly, if we were certain that we could do that, we would have to shoot the airplane down. This is not the trolley case. There's this uh, case, the trolley, the tram a case uh, from political philosophy, um, introduced by, I think, Philippa Foote in the 60s, uh, Virtues and Vices, where this tragic case is where you have a, a, a tram and there is one person on the tracks and you, you have a lever. You can chain, you can, you can decide whether this person is killed or if you don't do something, don't do that, five people are killed that are standing on a different track and you put the tram on the different track. So you basically decide whether one person dies or five persons are dying. Now on the trolley bus, uh, the, the tram case, uh, this is five people or one people and these are different people. Here in this case, if you would be sure, if you would be sure that uh, the people will die two minutes later anyway, and a great many additional people will die. If then, if we were certain, if you then say, so that these people can live two minutes longer, 3,000 additional people have to die. This strikes me as fanatic, in some sense. Maybe this is a provocative term, but if we were sure, I, I think we would have to shoot it down, uh, but we can't. And this again would, this would be my argument that artificial cases. And you can say, well, assume this is a terrorist, assume if we shoot down two minutes before, only these people will die, no one else will die, and these people will, because of that, be able, with 2,000 people, to continue their life as normal. Um, if we were sure, we would have to do it. But it's an artificial case. And, uh, you know, the decision time is, is ridiculous. Yeah. And, 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 and the very short time, very short time and typically uh, the, they're not answering, um, um, uh, a radio. Uh, they don't answer radio because they don't want, let, they don't want it to be known that this is actually hijacked. They want to use this uncertainty so that people don't shoot down. And the typical situation is so that you are really uncertain. And uh, it may well be that passenger airplanes have already been shot down in error uh, somewhere. Yeah, well, the last moment is, uh, is still a short time. And I, I agree. And of course, we, well, we can have a debate. We can have a debate. Perfectly fine. I'm not telling you it's impossible. We can have a debate in the structure of proportionality which certainty you would require for in which kind of situation. I'm perfectly happy to have this discussion. Uh, but it, it's, it's to speak not my aim to explain that the, uh, the, the decision of the Federal Constitutional Court is actually uh, wrong. So, I don't know in terms of time, Boyan, you have to... Uh, okay, because this gentleman had a question, but I can take it after class. Yeah, so that we can do this. Idea, because we know what you're after this. Oh my god, my god. Yeah, oh, I'm not supposed to. Your lecture would be So, uh, you heard, I think, two very, very interesting lectures about uh, proportionality principles in Serbia and about proportionality principles in general and about absolute rights. Uh, it is a quite broad, broad topic that cannot definitely be hardly even to be introduced in this stuff. But just this way of thinking that is quite different from the way of reasoning and thinking which rules as an introduction, I think it will serve you perfectly well. Uh, let us thank Martin once again for his Tomorrow, Giovanni Tuzet will be with us here from the University of Bologna.
and Maurizio Salusto, so it's an old Italian day, uh, <laughs> will uh, give lectures about fact-finding and facts and law, uh, which is also a topic regarding legal reasoning that is not often dealt with neither the Patrick Law nor uh, in legal philosophy. So it definitely will be an interesting day. Thank you all for coming and see you tomorrow at the same time. Bye. Thank you.